so much corporatism. Okay, you're live. Good afternoon, everyone. Glad you can join us for this afternoon's discipleship class. We appreciate everyone tuning in on Facebook or YouTube or the Tabernacle of Praise website. Uh, however you can, we're just glad that you're here with us to enjoy this beautiful Sabbath day. Uh, if you weren't with us earlier, we had a terrific service. Pastor Mark Paris was there and gave us a beautiful message about trusting in the Lord and remembering that the Lord is our shepherd and we shall not want. So let us keep that in mind while we're all socially distant and quarantined, so to speak, by co coronavirus. Uh, last week, we had the privilege of talking about life in the country. We're reading from the book Last Day Events by Ellen G. White, and we're on chapter eight this week. Chapter eight is talking about the cities. As I said last week, we talked a little bit about country living, where the Lord admonishes us to move out of the large cities into smaller cities, smaller towns, and out into the rural areas in preparation for the last day events, which we are already starting to experience. One of the things that's important to remember is sometimes we think it's very convenient to be in the cities, and it is to an extent. However, there's not one in 100 families, Ellen White says, that will be benefited by living in the cities compared with living in a more rural setting. One of the things that bothers us is as we are busy working and toiling for money, then our children are learning bad, evil, evil habits from being around uh, people in the city, all the city influences uh, causing our children to learn evil habits. It's so much easier for us when we're out in a more rural setting to keep our eyes yeah. stayed upon yeah. the Lord. One of the things that we can do when we're out in a more rural setting is have our own garden. Many of us now are uh, realizing the seriousness of the time that will come when we cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. And when you run to the store now, you see there's nothing on the shelves, right? Just imagine when there's plenty on the shelves, but you can't buy it because you don't have the mark of the beast and you're not following Satan's evil plan. But if you're out on your own, have your own land, you have your own garden, you can grow your own uh, fruit and vegetables. You can grow your own food substance to eat. And it's more nutritious. Uh, you don't have all the pesticides and chemical fertilizers and problems that we have with some of the food that we now eat from the stores. So move out a little farther, maybe uh, not immediately out into the wilderness, but start, lead, start going in that direction. Everyone wants to know, when should we go? Well, the Lord's going to let you individually know when to go. That's why it's so important for each of us to have our own life, our own spiritual life, our own spiritual connection with God, so that when he tells you it's time for you to go, then that's when it's time for you to go. Don't look to me and say, Brother Carol, should I move out into country? I don't know. <laughs> I'm waiting for the Lord to tell me when to move. And prayerfully, I'll be ready. My wife and I'll be ready to go when he calls and leads us in that direction. So this, uh, we want to get started with a word of prayer. And then we'll get right into chapter eight, which is the uh, chapter about the cities in the last day events book by Ellen White. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you once again for this beautiful Sabbath day that we're enjoying. We thank you most of all for a desire to draw a little closer to you to dig a little deeper in your storehouse, to draw, more, to be more and more like Jesus Christ and him crucified. We ask and pray for your Holy Spirit's guidance and direction. We ask and pray that you will open up your word to us, dear Lord. Bless us to hear your voice speaking to us and to follow where you lead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So everyone tuned on, if you had a blessed day so far, just say amen. amen. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. Looking at chapter eight, and if you are on Facebook or however you're on, feel free to type in a, a chat message to us and let us know that you're tuned in. And if you have a comment, feel free to speak up or to type in a message. It says chapter eight, upon receiving the curse of God, Cain had first with, had withdrawn from his father's household 
and he had chosen his occupation as a tiller of the soil. Now he founded a city and he called the name of that city after his eldest son. Anyone out mm-hmm. there know what the name of the city it was? It was called Enoch after Cain's first son. Isn't that interesting? Did it also? Huh? Yeah, I had to um, point out oh, that yeah. it was not the Enoch that was translated. What you oh, Karen, we have the phone lines open too, right? Yes. Yeah, the phones are open. So dial into that phone number that you got earlier. If you're not on Facebook or the website. Right. It wasn't the Enoch that walked with God. Wouldn't that be interesting? Uh, Cain had gone out from the presence of the Lord to seek his possessions and enjoyment in the earth under the great curse of sin. Thus standing at the head of that great class of men who worship the God of this world. There are so many people following Cain's example in worshiping after the God of men. Isn't that interesting? And then it goes on to say, for a long time, the descendants of Noah continued to dwell among the mountains where the ark had rested. As their numbers increased, apostasy soon led to division. And there were those group of people who wanted to cast off the restraint of God's law, which they felt was a constant annoyance to them. And after a time, they decided to separate from the worshipers of God and went to the plain of Shiner on the banks of the river Euphrates. Uh, Nowadays, that area would be uh, near the area of Iraq, the land of Shiner near the uh, Euphrates River. And they built this tower and, of course, the city of Babel. The next paragraph, it says that the cities are a hotbed of vice. Have you been to a city that you just felt had an evil influence to it or felt like it was a hotbed of vice? I'm not going to mention any names because I don't want people to write in complaining. But there are some cities that you just feel like it's full of evil and wickedness. And that's very true. You know, the cities of today are fast becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. There is many holidays encouraging idleness. I know we love our holidays so we can take a day off. But some of these holidays, you know, they just make them up. It's like the people that sell greeting cards and gifts make up holidays so that you can buy some products from them. But everybody's happy to get a holiday. In fact, people will mention something like, say, uh, Columbus Day, where now we recognize that Columbus didn't even found America. But people say, I don't care. I get a day off work anyhow, and I'll take it. So causing people to become... Uh, lazy and and idle. Also, the exciting sports, theater going, horse racing, gambling, liquor drinking, partying, stimulating every passion to intense activity. And of course, our youth who are easily led away to this type of popular current. Our young people need to know about God. And while we're living in the cities, that's a little harder because of all the influences. Now, you just imagine Compare where you are at today in the cities with all its distractions. And then think about if you lived out into a, in a country rural setting, you don't have all those distractions. You have nature, you have peace and quiet, you have your uh, friends who are close by, but your neighbors aren't right up on you, on top of you, living above you and beneath you in a big apartment complex. You don't have all the evil influence from your children that your children receive in the city. In fact, you will probably, you and your husband or spouse would probably be the only persons that they're receiving influence from, other than, of course, the heavenly angels and God's Holy Spirit. The cities are filled with confusion, violence, and crime. And guess what, folks? Those things are going to keep increasing until the end of earth's history. On every, on every hand are sights and sounds of evil, and everywhere are enticements to sensuality and dissipation. Have you ever heard that word dissipation? Do you know anyone know what that means? Dissipation means waste, a waste of space, a waste of time, wasting your time on evil doing, on partying, on drinking and carousing and uh, doing all the evil things that the devil wants you to do. So those type of enticements are what we run up against in the big cities. 
Now, before you just jump up and run out to the country, you want to take time to think it through, let God lead you, be prayerful, and plan for it. We had talked last week or a week before that you don't just jump up and go move anywhere. Suppose you move somewhere that has no fresh water. Suppose you move somewhere that has no access to the things that you'll need. What are you going to do then? You have to think things through. You have to plan. You have to let God lead you in what he wants you to do and where he wants you to go. So don't just run out willy nilly and say, well, we got to move out into the country. Let God lead you and let God's spirit be your guide. Think things through, plan for it. You would need to go, as they say, off the grid. So if you're going to go off the grid, of course, you're going to need probably solar panels for solar heat. You need water barrels to collect fresh water. You need access to a garden area. You know, you have to think about those things before you do it. Judgments are coming in the cities. It won't be a big surprise for those of us who have tried to read and try to stay abreast of what's going on, which is the whole point of this class, to be aware of last day events. We don't want these things to catch us unaware the Bible tells us to watch and pray so that we're not caught unaware. So by studying these different books that we study, the, the testimonies, volumes, last day events, uh, my life with Christ, these different books, spiritual books, it helps us to be aware of what's coming on the earth. If you know where your enemy's at and how he's going to attack you, then he can't surprise you, can he? And you can be prepared for whatever's coming your way. It says in uh, on page 111 in our book, the chapter is titled Judgments Coming on the Cities. Many times people will say, setting. one of the things that bothers us. Uh -uh. Many times people will say, oh, the Lord's punishing this city or the Lo that flood came because they were evil people or a volcano hit them because they were evil people. While God's God does judge cities for evil. Everything that happens, you can't blame on God. It says when God's restraining hand is removed, then the destroyer begins his work. Then in our cities, the greatest calamities will come. When God's restraining hand is removed, then we are going to see some real problems in this world. Right now, the angels are still holding back the winds of strife. So the disasters and occurrences that we see now, they're still tempered with mercy. But when God lets go of his restraint, then it's going to be unrestricted uh, calamity and evil and all manner of things that the devil will be allowed to do to this planet. So the Lord gives warnings to the inhabitants. God gave warnings to people before the Chicago fire, the fires in Australia, London, the city of New York. And be aware, folks, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. Have you ever heard of the shaking time? Well, everything that can be shaken loose from of their faith in God will be shaken. And for many people, it might not take a lot to shake their faith in God. There are people now who, because of the coronavirus, are giving up on God. They're saying God doesn't have power to stop it. God's not watching over this planet. God's not on the throne. Just, by, just because of the coronavirus, while it is a dangerous and a terrible pandemic, this is not the worst of things that's going to come. So if your faith can't handle this, how are you going to manage when the real uh, plagues start to fall? There's a verse, I think it's in 2 Kings. It says, if the footmen have wearied you, how can you run with the horses? And if the horses have wearied you, then how can you stand at the swelling of the Jordan? So we have to recognize that the judgments will be according to the weakness of the people and the light of truth that they have had. The time is near when large cities will be swept away and everyone needs to be warned of these coming judgments. One of the things that we like to do as humans, we like to think that we're pretty smart and that we can design buildings and develop structures that are earthquake proof and fire proof and flood proof. Well, when the, when the real problems start falling, even the most costly structures that are supposed to be earthquake proof and fireproof will perish in the flames of God's vengeance, just as Sodom and Gomorrah. 
So there is no such thing as earthquake proof, flood proof, fire proof, destruction proof when God's judgments start falling. The flattering monuments of men's greatness will be crumbled in the dust even before the last great destruction comes upon this world. So don't ever think that mankind is stronger than God. When God's plagues actually start to fall, there's nothing that's going to be standing that mankind has ever invented. These are all nice things while we have them. And that's one of the reasons we don't want to ever get attached to our goods is because they're all going up in flames in the last days. God is withdrawing his spirit from the wicked cities and costly mansions, marvels of architectural skill will be destroyed without a moment's notice. When the Lord sees that the owners have passed the boundary of forgiveness, the destruction by fire of stately buildings that were supposed to be fireproof is just an illustration of how short in time Earth's architecture and how short a time Earth's architecture will lie in ruins. When God says it's over, it's over. No matter what type of home you live in, what type of building you live in, what type of structure people have built, when God says it's coming down, it's coming down. When you think about it, in Jerusalem, they had built Solomon's temple and people thought that it was indestructible and that nothing could destroy God's temple. Well, what happened? When the Babylonians invaded, they burnt that whole temple down to the ground. There was not one stone left upon the other, just as Christ had predicted. So don't get too attached to these things of this world. Don't be like Lot's wife and be looking back at your mansion that you lived in or your nice car you drove, even if you drove a hoopty. You don't want to get attached to it because God will call us to leave these places and we have to be ready, willing, and able to leave when he calls us at a moment's notice. Now, when we think about God's wrath, God has not executed his wrath without mercy. As I had mentioned, God is still holding back the winds of strife. His message still has to be given to people. The people have to be shown how it is possible for God by a touch of his hand to destroy all the property that they've gathered against this last day. God does not want us to be materialistic. It's okay to have things. Don't get that uh, in your head that you shouldn't have anything. And it's nice to have nice things, but don't let them take the place of God. So if God blesses you with a nice car, remember who you got it from. If he blesses you with a nice home, remember that God gave it to you. A nice job, God allowed you to have it. Anything that we have, God has given it to us. And it's okay to have these things. Just don't let them take the place of God. Don't let the created take the place of the creator. If we're, lo we're looking at page 112 in our book, Last Day's Events, and it talks about New York City. It says, I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming on in New York, only that I know one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. Death will come in all places, and this is why I'm so anxious for our cities to be warned, she writes. And that was in 1906. Then also she writes, on one occasion when in New York, I was in the night season called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. In 1900, skyscrapers weren't so prevalent. So she's seeing forward into the future, story after story of buildings rising toward heaven. And these buildings were warranted to be fireproof and were erected to glorify their owners and buildings. Then she says, the scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. And men looked at the lofty, supposedly fireproof buildings and said, oh, they're perfectly safe. But these buildings were consumed as if they were made of pitch, which is like tar. The fire engines could do nothing to destroy this destruction and the firemen were unable to operate the engines. And when I was reading that verse, again, that's page 113, in last day events, when I was reading that, I was thinking about 9-1-1, the horrible destruction that happened on September 11th, where the two airplanes crashed into the building. And when you were, you know, it was terrible that we were able to see that happening live on television. And the buildings, they were there for a while. And people were thinking, wow, those buildings, they really strong. Look at how they're staying up. 
But after a while, the buildings just one story after another started collapsing like a pancake falling down, 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 and finally into a big crushed uh, heap of ashes. And there was nothing left, absolutely nothing left. So when God's vengeance is put upon this earth, that's what's going to happen to all these buildings that we have now. They'll all just burn up in the flames as if they were made of straw. It, she also writes about Chicago and Los Angeles. Scenes that would soon take place in Chicago and other large cities passed before me. Buildings were destroyed by fire and shaken down by earthquakes. It says, uh, sometime after this, I was shown a vision of Chicago. The buildings, the destruction, the object lesson for our people, warning them not to invest largely of their means of property in Chicago or any other city unless the providence of God positively opened the way and pointed out their duty to buy or as necessary in giving the note of warning to the cities. We have to remember that too, as I said, when, when we are looking for property to purchase out in the countries, we have to be led by God. We have to be led by God. We can't just use our own minds and say, oh, I know what's best. You know, this looks like a good place. It may, may have something wrong with it that you can't see. There might be some evil people living there that would uh, cause you problems. So again, before you even think of moving out to the country or a more rural city, ask God, where does he want you to go? Ask him to lead you and to guide you and to prepare a place for you. We know that God has a, a place prepared for us in heaven, but we want to ask him to prepare a place for us here on earth before we get to heaven as well. We have to be very careful that we don't uh, trust in our own uh, mindset and lean to our own understanding. But in all of our ways, we need to acknowledge God and ask him to direct our paths, right? As we continue to read, it's over on 114 talks about San Francisco and Oakland in 1903. Uh, she saw a vision of San Francisco and Oakland becoming as Sodom and Gomorrah. Even the cities where the judgments of God had fallen in consequence of such transgression, there is still no sign of repentance. Many people have been warned of their evil deeds and evil doing and evil actions and evil influence, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, and people still refuse to listen. How long are we going to be hard-headed and stiff-necked? God's giving people a warning to wake up. You think about this coronavirus pandemic we're in right now, and there's nothing good about a pandemic other than the fact that now we have time to study more, we have time to pray more, we have time to do our research, we have time to look into God's word, dig a little deeper in the storehouse. So it's not all bad because God is using this time and we need to use it to come closer to him, to acknowledge that he is our creator and it's he that has created us and not we ourselves. Take this opportunity to pray more. Get with your family, get with your friends, you know, on the phone or as we're doing on the internet and have a prayer circle. Pray about things that are going on. Pray about your provision. Pray that God watches over you. Pray that God blesses your family to stay safe. Use the opportunity for prayer. You've always wanted to read a certain chapter in the scriptures, but it seemed like you were always too busy. So pray and use this time now to study those chapters. Get your uh, Bible out, get your Bible concordance, get spirit of prophecy writings, get a Bible dictionary, get history books, use the internet to do research and study the Bible, not just zoom through it, it's nice sometimes we'll read the Bible in a year, but it's better to take time to actually study what you're reading. Also, there, uh, she saw that vision in 1903, and the great San Francisco earthquake and fire happened in 1906, three years later. You know, one thing about God, when he speaks to a prophet and the prophet prophesies, then everything that God says happens. Everything that God prophesies and the prophets share with the people, it always happens. So many times we say, oh, so-and-so said this or that. Uh, if it doesn't come true, then so-and-so is not a real prophet of God. True prophets of God speak the truth and it comes true just as God said. 
So the San Francisco earthquake was prophesied and it happened. Judgments on Chicago and Oakland, they happened. The judgments that have already come are a warning, but they're not the finishing of the punishment that will come on wicked cities. So more punishment is coming from God to wake people up, to wake people up and also to give people opportunity to repent and give their lives over to him. While we're thinking about it, and we have time to do some planning while we're on quarantine, let's think about how we can reach people for Christ. Let's think about how we can give warnings to the cities. We know what warning to give, that the Lord is coming. That's the warning we need to give. And give people opportunity and a chance to give their lives over to Christ. One of the best ways we have now is through the health message. Uh, Sister Carol is doing a health message talk on Wednesdays at 645. Tune in and listen. Find out how we can help spread this health message to those who don't know the truth. We can take opportunity with our health ministry leader and we can plan health outreach. Everybody seems to be sick. Have you noticed how now they're saying that the people who are most affected by coronavirus have underlying health problems? We can help address those health problems. We can give people knowledge and information that will help them to overcome whatever underlying health problems they may have. Those are things that we can think about while we have time. Plan it out, think it out, pray about it, and let God lead us on where we should go. It's our opportunity and privilege to help warn people of the impending crisis that we're about to come into. Always be looking for ways to share the gospel of Christ with others. One way to reach people, sometimes it's hard to get people to come to your church, but you can just talk to them about what they're facing with this virus, uh, how they're handling it. And that way you get to talking to people just on a casual, casual method way. And then you can ease into something more spiritual. And when people understand and they hear that you seem to know what you're talking about in other areas, they're more willing to listen to what you have to say in spiritual areas as well. The prophecies recorded in the Old Testament are the word of the Lord for the last days and will be fulfilled as surely as we have seen previous prophecies fulfilled. All the warnings of Christ regarding the events that will occur are now being fulfilled in these large cities. God is permitting these things to be brought to light that he who runs may read. The city of San Francisco is just a sample of what the whole world is becoming. Wicked bribery, misappropriation of funds, fraudulent transactions among men who have power to release, release the guilty and condemn the innocent. We've seen a lot of that recently, releasing the guilty and condemning the innocent. All this iniquity is filling other large cities of the earth, and it's just making the world as it was before the days of Noah. It's going to be that way when Christ comes. People just going on about their business without a second thought about Jesus. People engaged in fraudulent behavior, unfair dealings, dishonest transactions without a thought of Christ without a thought of an afterlife. And Satan is busy at work in these crowded cities. It, you can see Satan in the confusion, uh, the disorder, the hypocrisy that is even coming to the church, the lust of the flesh, the pride of the eyes, display of selfishness, misuse of power, cruelty and force used to cause people to unite for evil doing. All these things are the work of satanic agencies. Every day, I believe each one of us has seen or heard some of these things going on right close to us, right here in St. Louis where we're at, right there in Denver where some of you are at, New York, Chicago, small towns as well. You see these evil things happening. It's just the work, the work of the devil. We should have nothing to do with evil agencies. There are a lot of agencies that proclaim they're doing good things, but when you look at the underlying uh, policies and practices, they're all on the devil's side. And some people don't even realize it. So even in that situation, it might be your calling to bring some of these things to light. And the truth is the light. One of the things that was talked about here in this uh, chapter is called labor unions, a source of trouble for Adventists. This is on 116, page 116 in Last Day Events. 
And I always wonder what's wrong with labor unions. Some of the labor unions seem to be doing a good work. Now, remember, this was written back in the 19, early 1900s. The labor unions at that time were very strong. They were just coming about, and the, the business owners didn't want labor unions because labor unions wanted better wages. They want better working conditions. They want better benefits, and the owners of the business didn't want to do that because it cost them money. So there was a lot of violence, a lot of violence from the owners against the union organizers, and also a lot of violence from the union uh, membership against the owners. One case I had read about was in 1914, where one of the first labor union organizers, and funny, his last name is Trumpsky, and Trumpsky organized a labor union, and the, the owners of the industries back then were so angry at him that they had him killed, and they hung him up, they hung him and just put a sign on him that said, this is what's going to happen to the rest of y'all. This is a warning for the rest of you. So violence, willing to kill people for money and to keep the unions out or to get the unions in. Uh, many of us here now, I think, remember the uh, Columbine massacre in Colorado, where these guys came in and shot up the school. Well, there was also another massacre in Columbine. This one was in 1927, the coal miners union and the coal miners were on strike. Well, the union, the uh, coal mine owners didn't like it. So they got the police involved, the sheriff deputies, and there was 500 union, union members and their families gathered for a strike to protest. And the sheriff's department and the police, just, <clears throat> excuse me, started shooting into the crowd to break up the, the protest. They ended up killing uh, about six people and injuring dozens of others, including women and children. There's also some uh, more recent protests. Even in 1996, there were still union versus management protests where people were killed, people were blown up by bombs, uh, all kind of things going on with these labor unions. So the violence caused by labor unions and by the ownership, all because of money, all because of benefits, all because of selfishness. That's what was being talked about, having nothing to do with these type organizations because their underlying principle is one of violence. Whatever it takes to get what I want is what I will do. And of course, we know that's not a Christian characteristic. Christian characteristic is all about love, kindness, gentleness, long-suffering, faith, meekness, and temperance. Those aren't the type of principles that labor unions and trade unions are known for. The spiritual darkness that covers the whole world is intensified in the cities. More people, more population, more of everything is, is concentrated in the cities. So if you have a small amount of uh, wrongdoing in a small town, you have an intensified amount in a larger city. Even among the careless and, and indifferent, there are not a few whose attention may be arrested by a revolution of God's love for the human soul. So while we are not, while we're called to be prepared to move out of the cities, we still have a work to do in the cities, right? We're still called to minister to the cities. So while we might move out farther from the cities, we can still go in to minister to the cities uh, run uh, uh, run uh, restaurants in the cities, Bible studies, prayer groups. Our churches are still in the city to be a to be a lighthouse for Christ in the city. But we don't have to live there and dwell there continually. We don't want to have our sanitariums in the city because of the evil influence. The whole point of a sanitarium is to get away from those influences, to get out into nature, to commune with God, and to think about uh, His creation not what man has created. Everywhere our cities are calling for wholehearted, earnest labor from the servants of God. So until, we, until it's possible for us to leave the cities, until God calls us as individuals to leave the cities, as long as we remain, we still want to be active in doing missionary work. Remember, our whole purpose as Christians is to go ye therefore. 
So as long as we're in the cities, we still want to do uh, missionary work as God has called us to always be evangelizing, talking to people about Christ in every possible way, however limited our sphere of influence may be. Cities are increasing in wickedness and it's becoming more and more evident that those who re remain in them unnecessarily do so at the peril of their soul's salvation. So while we might be in the city now, be prepared when God calls you to leave. And when he calls us to leave, if we stay, then that's an unnecessary reason to stay. So just like Lot, there are lots in every Sodom. There are still good people, but when God calls us to move out, we need to be ready and prepared to move out. While we might have schools, churches, and restaurants still in the city, uh, we still want to give our best efforts towards those things. Schools, church schools established for children, restaurants where we can teach uh, healthy eating, school, uh, churches, of course, needed as lights in the community and as community centers. Otherwise, how would we reach the people in the cities and teach them the principle of right living? We have to do some work in the city, uh, but we are to work the cities from outpost centers. They don't live directly in the middle of things, but live a little further out and then always come in and do your best work for the Lord. As I had mentioned earlier, you don't want to just jump up and move out to the city. Uh, sometimes people rush into doing things and enter into something that they have no clue about. God does not require us to do that. Uh, back in 1893, there was a group who, in response to Sister White talking about moving to the cities, a group of about one or 200 people just jumped up and was planning to leave for a rural location as soon as possible. And she was pointing out to them that's not what God requires yet. God's going to speak to us uh, and we will have to have to move out. But just don't just jump up without thinking about it. You know, it makes no sense uh, to build, try and build a building without planning first. So don't just think you can just move out to the to the country all on your own and everything's just going to turn out fine. So don't just jump out there without planning it. But it does say, says uh, on page 121 in our book, page 121 talks about what's the signal for flight from the cities. Of course, the main signal is the Lord speaking to you through his Holy Spirit. Uh, don't expect a big blanket notice for everyone to move at once. Some people the Lord will call sooner than others. But one uh, definite signal, it says here, the time is not far when in the, like the early disciples will be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As a siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was a signal for the flight to the Judean Christians, that was their, their signal when the Roman army surrounded Jerusalem that was their signal for the Judean Christians to get out of the city. So the signal for us, <clears throat> excuse me, the signal for us to leave the cities is the assumption of power on the part of our nation. And what nation are we in? The United States of America. So the assumption of power by the USA in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. So when the U.S., enforces Sunday law, when the U.S. enforces the Sunday law, that is a big signal of us to move out of the cities. That is a huge warning. So anyone who wants a, a sign, that is a huge sign. Be on the lookout for these things. We all know that the Sunday blue laws are already on the books in many places. It just hasn't been enforced. But if you look, if you pay attention to what's going on now, just like the uh, laws that say the quarantine laws, the stay at home laws. Did you notice how quickly that was done? It was overnight. Overnight, they told us stay at home, don't come out, don't go to work, you know, those type of things. That's just how quickly the Sunday law can be passed. So don't expect things to happen gradually. And you think to yourself, oh, I'm going to wait. And then when I see this, then I'm going to wait a little more. And then I'll wait until I see this or that or the other thing. 
We don't have that luxury. Just as quickly as the stay at home order was given, the Sunday law could be passed. It would then be time to leave the large cities. When the USA joins forces with the, with the papacy to enforce Sunday law, then it's time to leave the cities. Preparation to leave smaller, smaller cities for our homes in secluded places among the mountains. So there is sort of a transition from the cities to smaller towns and then out into the wilderness when the time comes. But don't, again, don't wait. If God tells you to go, then he's made provision for you. Even now, we should start looking just to get familiar with what it takes to move to the country or move to a smaller town. You know, we often think, oh, wouldn't it be great to live in a small town or something? Or, uh, you know, whether you people you say it'd be nice to live in Mayberry. Some of us remember Mayberry on the TV show. Nice, peaceful town. Everybody was friendly. Everybody left their doors open. And, you know, it was just happiness everywhere. Think about it. If the, if the decree was given tomorrow, where would you move? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought, thought about what you would uh, look for in a place to move to? Would you look for a good schools? Would you look for other people who believe as you do? Would you move somewhere where you have relatives? Would you want to move to a colder climate, a warmer climate? A lot of things to think about. Would you want to live in a mountainous area or a desert area? You know, those type of things you can think about now while you have time, while you have opportunity to do a little planning and a little foresight. And then when God tells you it's time to go, then you'll be uh, ready and you'll have listened to him all along. And he can uh, you can follow him as Abraham followed God when he told him to leave. One of the things that we're always concerned about when we talk about the last day events is Will God protect us during the last day events? Will Christians be killed during the last days? Will God protect us? Here it says on page 121, says some righteous still in the cities after the death decree has been passed. In the time of trouble, we all fled from the cities and villages, but were pursued by the wicked who entered the houses of the saints with the sword. So there will be evildoers out to kill people who are following God. But then it says, as the saints left the cities and villages, they were pursued by the wicked who sought to slay them. But the swords that were raised to kill God's people broke and fell powerless like straw. Angels of God shielded the saints. Isn't that amazing? That is truly a miracle. The angels of God shielded the saints says, though a general decree has fixed a time when commandment keepers may be put to death, the enemies in some cases anticipate the decree and even before the time specified will try to take the saints' lives. There's always somebody ready to jump the gun, right? There's always somebody who's uh, gung-ho about trying to get out there before everyone else. So there will be people who go before the decree to try and uh, harm those who are following after Christ. Uh, one example is you think about the immigration issue that we have in America, people coming up from Mexico, crossing the border illegally. And there are, there's the immigration forces the federal government has, but there's also just everyday citizens out there with rifles and guns, and they're out there chasing down people. They have no authority to do that. No one gave them permission or authority, but they're just jumping the gun all, uh, as they would say, all in their uh, jump to be patriotic. The same thing will happen when the Sunday decree is passed and is passed to kill the Sabbath keepers. There will be people out there who call it their patriotic duty to kill Sabbath keepers, and they'll jump out, jump the gun before the actual decree is even passed. But the Bible says the angels of God was shield the saints. Some are assailed in their flight from cities and villages, but it says that swords raised against them break and fall as powerless as a straw. Others, I really like this part, it says, others are defended by angels in the form of men of war. So whatever happens, we know that God is our protector. 
We know that God is our shield and our buckler and our strength, and we have no reason to fear. The main thing that we need to focus on is making sure that our calling and election is sure with Christ. Make sure that we accept Christ crucified, that we have acknowledged him as the son of God, and that we accept his sacrifice for us on Calvary. Repent and give our lives to Jesus. Allow his spirit to dwell in us and to shine out from us so that others will see our good works and we can and glorify our Father in heaven. So as we are all committed to God, he is committed to protect us and to keep us against that, that last day, those last day events. Stay in touch with Christ at all times. Our duty is to be witnesses for him. We can do that best as we stay prayed up, as we stay studied up, as we communicate to our family, friends, and neighbors that Jesus loves them and wants them to be saved in his righteous kingdom. We don't have to be so concerned with things on this earth because everything on this earth is going to burn up. We want to be concerned with things in heaven. So as we continue to make Christ our example, our Lord and our Savior, let's continue to share his word with others who may not know the truth. Let's continue to pray. Let's continue to study. Let's continue to watch and pray. Let's continue to be ready for we know not the hour of the Lord's soon appearing. I want to thank you all for tuning in on our uh, website, on Facebook, or on the phone. This week we went over chapter eight, the cities, talked a little bit about why we need to uh, be moving out of the cities. We also talked a little bit about last day events. Again, Every Sabbath at 2.30 we have, p.m., we have our discipleship class. Next week is going to be Sister Karen Lewis, and she'll be teaching out of the book Testimonies, Volume 1, uh, Chapter 62, is it, Karen? Chapter 61. Chapter 61 out of Volume 1 of Testimonies uh, by Ellen G. White. So I want to thank you all for tuning in again, and we we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, before that, though, remember Wednesday night, 645, Sister Carol will be doing some health tips, how to manage during the coronavirus pandemic. We'll also have our Tabernacle of Praise prayer meeting and testimony session. And then there's a discipleship class next week will be led by Sister Lewis, Testimonies, Volume 1, Chapter 61. Thanks again. Let us close out with prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to learn about your word, to be on guard for what's coming in these last days, Lord. Bless us that we'll hear your voice speaking to us and be prepared to follow where you lead and when you leave. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. Thank you all. Continue to have a blessed Sabbath day. God bless you.